Hi, I'm Raina Gilead, and this is episode 14 of the Lester Leadership Series. This series explores AEC industry trends, diversity, equity, and inclusion, while highlighting the voices of the industry. Today, I have the honor of interviewing an extraordinary businesswoman and also a dear friend of ours here at Lester, Daryl Davis. Daryl is an award-winning communications professional with an impeccable track record of more than 35 years of communications excellence. She is a leader in developing stra strategy, equity-first communications and public engagement programs for complex planning and environmental and construction projects, civil works infrastructure, waste, wastewater, and community revitalization programs. She oversees day-to-day -day management of her firm and serves as lead strategist for agency accounts. Darylin is an accomplished and respected leader and collaborator who specializes in integrated approaches to advancing public participation in social responsibility and impact, diversity, equity, and multicultural inclusion initiatives. A proven advocate, advisor, and visionary thought leader, Darylin is known for breakthrough communications and public engagement strategies that drive social change, enhance brand reputation, and strengthen connections among and across stakeholders. Her strategic communications and engagement efforts have strengthened support and awareness around some of the region's most important capital improvement projects. Her firm recently won the American Planning Association Award of Excellence for Public Outreach on the Bayview Community-Based Transportation Plan, CBTP, and the Public Relations Society of America Silver Anvil uh, award for the SFPUC Sewer System Improvement Program Public Awareness Campaign. Under Darylin's leadership, her company, D&A, has been a trusted partner and uh, strategic communications advisor to San Francisco Public Utilities Commission since 1997, helping to launch Clean Power SF and establish the Community Benefits Policy, the first of its kind in the nation for a public utility. Darylin serves as the community engagement consultant on mega projects like the $6.9 billion sewer system improvement program, SSIP, and the $4.8 billion water, billion water system improvement program, Salesforce Transit Center, Port of San Francisco Water Resiliency Program. Darylin, thank you so much for being here. What a resume. <laughs> I had no idea you were going to read the whole thing, <laughs> but thank you. Yes, no, um, thank you. <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, again, it's like we're we're so lucky to have you here with all of your expertise. This is, I'm really just going to be like, you know, sort of getting at the very surface of all the things that you have extensive knowledge about. So one of the things is, you know, I know your work has really had an incredible impact. And I know one of the things that has been really important to you is political advocacy, which leads me to my first question, which is basically why? Like, why have you felt it was important to participate in political um, and advocacy groups such as SF Local Business Enterprise Committee? Oh, well, that's a, a big question. Um, it's something that I've been passionate about, about having, ensuring that the people have access small businesses have access to work and yeah. construction and projects to contracts specifically. Um, and it has been as a small business owner, myself who started many, many years ago, it was a long road and it was right. a difficult road. Um, and I really wanted to find ways to make it easier for young women, young people starting off a business to gain opportunity within construction and in contracts um, in cities all across the Bay Area and certainly in San Francisco where there are literally $5.8 billion of con contracts within city and county of San Francisco. They contract out $5.8 billion. And a lot of the, the that money uh, is, you know, should be going to small businesses that really support the economy 
of San Francisco. And I really wanted to work to help those businesses get an opportunity and uh, uh, an equitable opportunity to uh, bid on the, that work. Uh, and, and particularly for women, um, yeah. it is very difficult in this, in, in, in this industry to um, be recognized and to be seen as an, an equal, um, to be considered for the big opportunities um, that um, are out there all throughout the nation, but particularly uh, here in San Francisco. So um, I want, you know, my desire is just to be a mentor and a support. Um, and we've had a lot of success. Um, I, I sit on the LBE advisory committee as the um, vice chair. And um, just about two years ago, um, we were able to make some changes to the legislation that ensures that local businesses get a fair chance at uh, contracting. And we made some changes to that that had took us 20 years to get those changes made, which is increasing the threshold, which is um, the number that you have to define as your revenue. And those numbers had not been increased for 20 years, but costs have gone up significantly. So a lot of firms were being pushed out of the program far too early um, based on the cost of living in San Francisco and doing business here. So I'm just, um, I, I really want other people to have um, opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that I mean, that, that's obvious with the work that you do and your dedication. Um, you know, I think that you mentioned it. Being a woman in this industry, you're faced with your challenges, you're faced with difficulties, as well as also owning your own business and being, you know, a, a female business woman in general. So I wanted to ask this question because I think that sometimes within this kind of a question, you get a gem that you didn't really expect to know about somebody, um, especially someone who you deem to be very successful and has it together in these different things. We don't always talk about some of the more challenging moments. So I'm sort of, I'm asking this as like, what's your most valuable or life-changing moment in business? And I'm also kind of like shaping this as like uh, the, the concept of your best failure. So like your best failure that ended up contributing to the course or direction of your career journey. Oh boy, that's a, uh, there've been so many, both on the, uh, the positive and the negative side. <laughs> I've been through so many different, um, challenges or experiences that have brought me to where I am today. But, uh, you know, I think the thing that really drives me is to have the passion and the dedication to do excellence mm. and be committed to excellence and doing good work. I mean, that is really what we strive for to make sure that we are bringing people to the table um, around important social community issues and, and doing it in a way that is meaningful and um, that we do it in a, also not only just in a way that is meaningful, but brings quality to these kind of conversations. So, yeah. uh, you know, having the opportunity to engage with people from all different parts of the Bay Area in San Francisco has been my greatest joy in my work. And, and I've learned so much about the history of San Francisco and what advocacy is all about and what participation and inclusion is all about. And I think the thing that's been probably the most challenging or, you know, my best failure, um, you know, I think it's really about leading. It's mm -hmm. the thing to learn to lead. I did not go to business school. I um, did not have a master plan or a business plan when I started. So I learned everything by going to Barnes and Nobles would let you sit in there all day long and you could read all the books that you wanted to read, um, you know, and so I did that. I spent a lot of time just teaching myself and then finding good mentors. You know, I think that has been the, the thing that has helped me through most of all is having people who support you, are willing to share information with you. Um, 
I think the, the first thing that I, 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 I didn't know how to write a contract. I had no idea how to write a con. I, I didn't know what you're supposed to put in a contract. And, you know, I thought, oh, I'm just going to get this book and I'm going to put all these things in there. And um, I sent it to my first client and I, uh, he was so polite to me and <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, the guy was so polite to me. He said, um, I, I, I appreciate you sending this over to me, but I'm going to send you uh, a, a, a shell of a contract of what a contract should look I'm like. I'm going to send you a real a contract. Real contract. <laughs> uh, oh, I was wow. so embarrassed um, of, of so much that I did not know, uh, right. but was willing to do the work to learn it. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, those have been some of my challenges is learning about leadership, how to mm -hmm. motivate people, how to acknowledge them, appreciate them in a way that is meaningful and helping them to grow um yeah. and um yeah and then and just to, and really being committed to excellence and in, in everything that we do as a company um that we you know i said mediocrity does not live in dna i love that i love that um i i i really like that story about the contract because i think um you know, no matter what your business is or what kind of like sort of life direction you've taken, I a lot of people can relate to that moment where you say, okay, got this, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you just, you also have to go for things. Um, and, and that's where the life and the lessons and the learning, you know, come from. So it's also, you know, and even just you being in Barnes and Nobles and being like, okay, I'm gonna figure this it out. That's that's a lot of business is I gotta figure this out, you know. So having having that sort of uh oomph, you know, is 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 always gonna serve you. So I would say, what actually made you start your own business? Was there a moment? Was did something happen? Did something not happen for you? That's you know, what 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 was it that propelled you into starting your own business? Uh, it was very clear to me uh, after working in the legislature for nearly 10 years, and I was press secretary to then former speaker Willie L. Brown Jr. And um, it was I was it was a job that I that I learned while doing it. Mm. I had not been a press secretary before, um, and I learned a lot in that period of time, not only about that job but about politics and excellence right. um, and I think after 10 years of working um, really around the clock really understanding how public policy works yeah. and being in rooms with policymakers and people who were advocates for things and never seeing people that look like me and I said, there's something wrong with this picture because you're, as you're trying to gain information about how a policy should be written and you don't have uh, a diversity of people around you to give you insight, you're, the policy has unintended consequences. And I said, you know, I, I see that there's a gap here and there's an opportunity to bring people together, bring more people to the table, more voices, more perspectives to help shape the outcomes of policies. And uh, when um, Mayor Brown, call him Mayor Brown now, uh, <laughs> yeah. Speaker Brown at the time um, was turned out, I decided that you know I would take a break and um, potentially start my own company um, wasn't really sure because I had to work really hard for um, mo you know, multiple years. And um, I got a call from the Oakland Unified School District. Um, and at the time, in maybe before your time, there was an issue around using Ebonics in the Oakland Unified School District, which was a dialect. And um, they called me in to help them shape kind of what the story was because in fact, they had said that they wanted to use 
Ebonics as a platform to bridge the gap to standard American English. Well, the story came out that they wanted to teach Ebonics. And so I started on that journey on helping them unravel this and give uh, this story and to really give it some framework where he ended up going and uh, presenting to Congress um, around the need for African-American students um, to have better education because in Oakland, there was, there was a D average uh, across the board for most black children. And um, the point was that they were using a tool. Uh, so that I stayed there for months working on this project. We had this during the uh, Christmas holiday. So news cycle was very slow. We had people from all over the world, from Germany, from India, that were really fascinated about this concept. Uh, and it gave us, a, gave the school district a great opportunity to ask for more money. Um, and it, it proved uh, that they were able to make an impact. Um, and that started my journey, that having those kinds of conversations with people from all walks of life, from all parts of the world, how it shaped the story around the needs of young Black children. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was the beginning of my career. Uh, and I ended up getting a little tiny office uh, in San Francisco. I rented a little space from a friend who had had a large company and she said oh yeah you could have this it was literally 200 square feet maybe uh and i started out with me and one other person who i'm still very close friends with and um it was just a he and i in this little tiny cubicle wow uh, yeah but it was with the intention to um really bridge that gap wow that's incredible. I mean, also 200 square feet now in San Francisco, probably running about $1,500, maybe. <laughs> like, it's maybe true. that might even be a deal. Yeah, I know. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I think th this sort of leads into my next question because actually, well, I, I was going to ask you, what is it like being a female leader in your industry? But I can't ask about what it's like to just be a female leader. I also have to ask about being a black female leader, to be a person of color and be a leader. And, you know, you're holding these, these different hats. You're holding, you know, these different kind of, um, well, some people would look at them as disadvantages. I, of course, know that they are advantages. So I'd love to know just your perspective on what it has been like, what it is like to be a female leader and a person of color who is leading. Yeah, um, it is my greatest honor. Uh, it is not easy. Um, it has become easier as the years have gone on um, because I'm in an industry that's primarily um, white uh, and I'm usually the only person of color in the room. And I find that to be an honor to be able to be at the table to have these conversations. And um, the biggest challenge is, you know, around whether I get the contracts that are, um, have much value to them, like, are they valuable? Are they uh, in, from, from a cost perspective? Or do I only get the smallest piece of the smallest piece of everything. Right. Um, and uh, after this many years, I can now ask I, uh, for what I should be paid uh, and how percentages of contracts that I should get based on my experience, knowledge, and expertise. Um, and it's not always easy. It's a lot of navigating and understanding and reading the room and knowing that um, really understanding what people are most interested in achieving because at the end of the day everybody wants to reach the goal and if I can bring something of value to that conversation then people are much more open to hearing you as what your contribution is to get them to where they want to go um, and we know that communications uh, in a construction world is incredibly important because people can shut down projects which cost on a day-to-day -day basis quite a bit of money. Um, they can derail funding. 
um, four projects. So the role of in commun for, communi for communications is critical. Yeah. And I always have to elevate that because I'm with engineers and people who are architects and you know, they are, they're, they're thinking so different than mine uh, in terms of my work. Um, and I have to help them connect the dots all the time. Um, but it is a joy to, to do this work, but it is not easy. Uh, and particularly um, when you're a woman running a company like this, um, even who you hire, it's hard to hire people because mm. um, there aren't, um, people don't have the experience of working for a woman of color. And so there are a lot of things that come up with that, um, that come out and come up. Um, and, uh, but you learn to navigate it and it keep, uh, you know, if you are clear about your focus and your mission. Um, yeah. That's it. That's very interesting. I know there's more on that. That might be the uncut version of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> the in-depth version. Um, so I would say, uh, I mean, a, a, along with the many hats that you wear within the industry and within your business as an owner, a CEO, but also an active community member, you're a mother. I mean, you know, how do you create balance in your life, in life, if, yeah. if balance even exists? <laughs> how, how do you do that? or attempt to do that. I think we're all trying, yeah. at least attempting. You definitely try, are attempting to do it, at <laughs> least for me. I, I'm just, I, I, am a, I am a workaholic. I, I, it's not that I'm a workaholic, I love what I do. So I like doing it and I, I have to stop myself um, because I am a mother and I'm a daughter and I'm a wife. Right. Um, so all of those things require the same kind of attention and, um, the first thing is I have to take care of myself because I cannot take care of anybody else until I take care of myself. So I do things like I walk, I go to the gym and I go very early in the morning um, to get my day started. Uh, and I think it's really important that women take the time to take care of their bodies and to nurture their friendships. Mm -hmm. um, with other women or other people that they are close to, um, uh, to renew yourself. You, you, it's, and the, we have weekends for a reason. And, um, that's part of it. It's just the renewal and also my spirit Yeah, and renewing my spirit because you're out here fighting, uh, for, for others and for yourself all the time. And at some point you have to fill that vessel up again to be able to continue. And yeah. uh, so the spirit part is equally as important. Um, and then the, the physical health part is important. I don't, I'm not as good at eating my lunch. <laughs> you know, I skip lunch up too many times. My husband always tells me, you didn't eat lunch today because I left <laughs> your lunch on the desk, uh, on the countertop and it's still here. <laughs> so, I'm still working at it. <laughs> hey, we're all works in progress, but I, I mean, I would say, you know, <clears throat> definitely the physical health, the spiritual health, the mental health, you know, Lunch will get on that list. Lunch will get in there, but the list looks good. Um, <laughs> so the last question I have for you really is what advice would you give a young woman looking at this career path? What would you tell her today? Um, uh, I guess I, something that my mom has said, um, you know, just don't be afraid of your dreams. And the space between your dreams and reality. Uh, just go for it uh, and keep going uh, and believe in yourself. First and foremost, you have to believe in yourself. Uh, and then set your target. Fall, and that's okay because you're going to get up and you're going to learn from what, whatever happened. And you're going to use that in the next situation. And... Um, Build friendships, you know, get to know people. You may not like them, but get to know them. 
you may find that you have more in common than you dealt with someone. I'm so glad we had that recorded because now I can play that for myself every morning when I need motivation to go <laughs> out of the door. <laughs> that's wonderful. No, that's wonderful. I mean, I, unless there is anything else that you really, that's on your heart to add, I mean, I am just so thankful for that you were able to join us, that we were able to squeeze yeah. into your, you know, your wonderfully busy schedule. And um, this was fabulous, yeah. really. Unless there's anything else to add, I want to say thank you so, so much. Well, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I was looking forward to this interview with you, particularly. <laughs> so thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Yay. Now you can get to your weekend. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Sterling.